Hi, this is Toby Salgado. I'm here to help you answer a question that we all have. How can I build my business faster and better? Each week, I interview top producing real estate agents, coaches, and authors. I find out, I dig in, I find out how they did it, where they struggled, and how they overcame the obstacles that in, inevitably gets in front of all of us. And I did that so both you and I, so we all can reach our own full potential. If you want more of the tips and strategies we cover in this session, you're gonna to wanna to do two things. First, go to our site, superagentslive.com, and subscribe to the show on iTunes so that you don't miss any of the conversations we have in the future. And second, download my free ebook and learn how to stack the deck in your favor. Before we get going, let's hear from our sponsor. We all know the best kind of referral is one from our sphere or farm, but how do we stay top of mind? Now, most people, they take a three-pronged approach, right? They door knock in their farm, they call people, and they mail them. And most people fall down by not getting to their people, their sphere, their farm. They don't get them engaging content. And look, you know, sure, we can list them a postcard, or we can send them an article that we think is going to be of interest to them. Our new sponsor, Discover Publications, takes that one step further. For just slightly more than the cost of a stamp, Discover Publications creates a completely customized newspaper. Now, they'll go out and they'll curate content, or you can create your own. All of my sponsors are white labeled. Now, I called, prior to having them on the show, I called some of Discover Publications clients, and I talked to this one guy, and he does some interesting things. He'll go out and interview restaurants that are in his farm, in his sphere. He creates a write-up. He, interestingly enough, resells advertising in his own newspaper to his trusted network, whether that's the plumber or the insurance agent. And by the way, this guy has 60% market penetration. He told me the paper has cemented those numbers. If you're interested, go check out discoverpubs.com. Let me know what you think. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Yeah. Even after a hundred plus interviews, I still love that intro. Yeah. Hey, real quick, radio. I haven't talked about it in a while. If you are a top producer, if you do 80 transactions, 100 transactions, you want to add another 100, I can get you there with radio. It's the silver bullet of real estate. Nobody can get you on like I can. If you go right to the radio station, sure, you can buy ads. Guess what? They're, they're going to eat your lunch. You, you don't know what a rotator ad is. You don't know how to talk about their dig, biggest day part. So if you're interested, give me an email. We'll talk. Let's see if we can put another 100 deals on the board for you. All right, let's get to the show. Today on the show, we have a treat. I've been fortunate enough to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with today's guest, and he has a fascinating background. He sold real estate built brokerages, and then he got recruited by Tony Robbins to come in and be a key figure in growing the Tony Robbins brand. I'm thrilled to welcome Rock Thomas. Hey, Rock, thanks for taking the time out today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Toby. I'm very excited to be on your call. I've heard a lot of great things about your show. Hey, so, so listen, Rock, I've given a brief overview of your background, but take a minute, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and then, uh, and then what, what you're doing today. I know you've you got a bunch of stuff in the air. Well, very briefly, grew up on a farm. I learned how to work really, really hard. Then I uh, decided that I'd get into real estate in my late 20s and was not very good to start with at all. After about a year, I made one sale. I got some coaching and realized that if you follow systems and models, you can have a lot more success that way and was very coachable. Uh, went on to become uh, a salesperson of uh, 100 homes a year then bought a, uh, one of the largest franchise up here in Canada, where I am located. Uh, 94 agents at the time grew it to 270 agents over four years, and then sold it about uh, 10 years after I bought it, wrote a book, and started traveling around North America, teaching and trading agents on, uh, uh, you know, my niche was mindset, because I felt there's a lot of people that know what to do, but they don't do what they know. 
So I got really into that game. There's a lot of other guys that teach the technical stuff, the scripts, the dialogues, and the farming and all that, which I can do, and I do do. But I really, the juice for me is getting into people's mind, getting people to take action. And now I'm opening up a Keller Williams franchise. I have one office already. I'm opening up a second one. I have a team. I'm very excited about that. I'm involved with a fantastic mastermind group called Go Abundance. So life is rich. Life is exciting. And uh, I feel very blessed. Okay. So, so that's interesting, man. So, so you, you, in terms of talking about coaching, so you did one deal your first year and then all of a yeah. sudden, you, then you went to, to 100 after some coaching. Um, yeah, I'm curious, man, what, you know, was that a, when you were doing one deal to 100, was that a more of a mindset thing or was that like a mechanics thing for you or was it a combination? Well, I say I would say, in fairness, it's a combination okay. because I was taking action, but it's kind of like planting seeds on concrete. You can take a lot of action, but if you're not doing it the right way or at the right time, you're not going to get a result, and you're just going to get frustrated. So I was taking action. I was knocking on doors. I was going out and meeting people, but I didn't have the body language figured out. I didn't have some of the scripts and dialogues, and therefore I was getting somewhat discouraged once I got some of the, the, the how-tos, the skills, then I started to get more success, and I combined that with maintaining a proper attitude and learning how to connect with people. That's when it took off. So it was a combination of the two. Interesting. Okay, so, so uh, I'm just taking some notes here, man. I, you're, you're saying a lot of good stuff, and I can't keep up. But okay, so you were taking action. You were door knocking. You were, you were calling. You were doing all the right stuff. But what you said was you said what I didn't have right was uh, – uh, I don't, I'm not sure if you said scripts, but you specifically mentioned body language and, and uh, to break it down a little bit. Cause there's the, you know, there's this total presence, uh, theory or viewpoint. Can you, can you break that down a little bit for everybody? Yeah. Yeah. I think you're, you're right on to it. So if you're confident when you're sitting face to face with a client and they ask you, for example, will you cut your commission? My answer might've been, uh, no, but the confidence wasn't there and they could feel it in my, the way I, I, I squirmed in my chair, crossed my legs, crossed my arms, what have you. And then I was, I was in a position where they could feel it and they weren't able to, um, they, they were just all over me and they were, they were going to take, uh, you know, advantage of that. Over time, what I learned was more posture, uh, more confidence, um, how to uh, hold myself, the tonality of the, uh, of the response. And it might have been, you know, will you cut your commission? No. Any other questions? And then it just became a different communication style. And then, of course, there's nothing like success, you know, encouraging you to be more successful. And once I became successful, then, you know, it, my confidence went up and one fed the other. Right. And so, and so this total presence idea is that, you know, so you have your scripts, you have what you say, and that's in terms of what people digest from that, that's like 7%. Then you have your tonality and that might be 28%. But the remainder, right, this, the remaining 50% of what people get from you is, is, that, is that body language. Um, is, I mean, I don't know if you can talk about that a little bit more. I mean, because there can be, you can have a confident uh, body language, but, and then there can be like sort of like a, an overpowering body language. Um, do you want to yeah. talk about that for a second or not? Yeah, yeah, and I would say that in fairness, because of my lack of confidence, when I learned that there was the, the 738-55, right, the tonality, the body language is 55. Okay. Um, when I learned that, um, I probably went overboard, like a, like, a, like a lot of things I've done in my life, is I stood really tall, shoulders back, head up, right. you know, looked people straight in the eye and didn't take the glare off and right. hold the presence, and I think I intimidated people. Um, and, and made them feel um, like I had a thing called better than, like I was a better than person. And, and, then, and to be better than, the other person must feel less than. And that's not, there's no likability factor in that. Really great salespeople tend to have what I call a likability factor. Mm. And it means that they're, they're, you feel safe with them. You know, in, in life, as much as we are sophisticated today, the essence of sales comes from trust, and trust comes from feeling safe. So it's great to be confident and knowledgeable and a resource, but you also want to be personable and you also want to be relatable. And I think I learned that over time, Toby. It wasn't, you know, at first I was awkward. Anytime you do something for the first time, you're a bit awkward. But as you start to realize 
you can be confident, but you can also be humble. Right. Yes, man. Yeah. Sorry. That's, I was just going to say that, man. So you took my fire away, but go, yeah, dig into that a little bit. Yeah. So, so the, the key is that you don't, you know, a great salesperson I learned over the years is you ask more questions than you talk. So you ask lots of questions and you, you allow them to unveil what is important to them. And then confidently you can guide them and, and move them in that direction. So, I mean, I took a course called uh, NLP, it's Neuro Linguistic Programming, and you learn about the relationship between words and body language, and I would recommend that for anybody that wants to take their sales to a higher level is, is study that or pick up a book or go online and look at that a little bit and understand that. What we're talking about is the words are important, but they're less important than uh, the posture that you have and the, and the position uh, and, and the way you say it. And you know this being in radio, the importance of of the tonality when you're communicating, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and the other thing, you know, with NLP too is, you know, and, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're talking about here is, is at one side really, really basic, but it's so, so powerful, right? So, you know, if people are calling on the phone, right, they should smile. That, that comes through. Yes. Yes, totally right. And that's the essence of it. And, and we teach the, the, the salespeople. And, you know, the, the funny thing about it is, is the basics still last through time. So put a mirror in front of your phone while you're on the phone mm. and smile while you're on the phone and watch how your results will improve based on that one silly little thing. Amazing. Yeah. So, so you said success breeds success, right? So, again, you went from one deal to 100. Uh, you know, you went from 94 agents to almost 300 agents. Those, those are, in terms of building a business, building a brokerage, right? Th those are two different things, right? Selling real estate is one thing. Building a brokerage is a, that's, it takes a whole different skill set, a whole different mindset. You know, what were you trying to accomplish when you, you know, you built it, you bought it, you built it, and you sold it? And I mean, you, you really have had kind of this crazy uh, career. I mean, what, what, what sort of drives you, Rock? Why did you go, you know what I mean? Like, you went from one to 100 deals. Why didn't you go to 300, right? Um, well, I, you know, I think we all, we've all heard this before, your big why. What is the, uh, the motive? Uh, Tony talks about the fact that there's two things that inspire us. It's either, um, you know, inspiration or desperation. Mm. And I think that I had a little bit of both working for me. I think becoming a master of, of understanding what the meaning of pain and pleasure and how that can motivate you. So, in, for instance, for some people, if I say exercise, to them, that means pain. Somebody else, it means pleasure. Well, I've trained myself so that exercise means pleasure. How do I do that? I look at the consequences if I don't exercise, and I magnify them. That's where the NLP comes in. So I go, if I don't exercise today, no big deal. If I don't exercise tomorrow, no big deal. But if I continue like that for the next 10 years, I'm probably going to get diabetes or I'm going to get cancer, and I make it worse than it is in my mind. And I emotionalize it to the point where I'm, like, I'm highly motivated now to go and exercise. Then I do the same thing on the other side is I go, if I exercise, I'm going to feel more energetic. I'm going to look better. I'm going to be a better partner. I'm going to be, I'm going to live longer. I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to perform better at work. And I magnify those. And now I'm supercharged to go out and exercise or perform that behavior that before I resisted. And I learned how to do the same thing with prospecting. Hmm. So not everybody feels like prospecting, you know, generally it can be associated with pain, rejection and, and humiliation and waste of time, et cetera, et cetera. So I did the same thing as I just visualized and, and magnified the pleasure by prospecting. I get to create another listing another listing leads to another buyer leads to another sale leads to money and allows me to fly first class or go on holidays or be a great father or take my kids to Disney World, and I want to experience all those things. I want to create all that. And if I don't take action right now, if I resist, if I give into this weakness and associate pain to picking up the phone, then I'm a freaking loser, and I'm going to be dead and broke and on the side of the street and a <laughs> bum. And I just freaking make these amazing pictures in my mind using the creative creativity that I have. And then boom, I'm picking up the phone. Boom, I'm picking up the phone. Boom, I'm picking up the phone. And before you, before you, I, you can't stop me because I'm so fired up because I've created that that those images of pain and pleasure in my mind that drive me towards success. 
don't know if that makes any sense. No, that makes total. Uh, look, I mean, uh, that makes total sense. I love it. And and there's I mean, there's two things here that we can dig into. We can talk about visual. I don't want to, but we will in a second. But you know, we can talk about visualization. We can also talk about you know, Tony will say that most people will run from pain and run toward pleasure. And if you can reverse that, and that's what you're really saying. You use visual visualization to reverse that. You wanted to run towards that pain, and 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 you you. Okay, well, let's talk about that in a second. Here's what I want to talk about. So your why, right? So Simon Sinek has a, a book, and it's a it's great TED Talk, Start With Why. Um, right. This is something that we all hear. This is something that we all sort of know, right? We know we need to know our why, right, and digest that. And people you – know, that's one of the hardest things for people. You know, people say, especially if you're in that desperation mode, people say, well, my why is I want to – get rich. My why is I want to become a millionaire. And I don't know if that's, that's a good enough why. Maybe, can you, can you talk about the why and, and, and what is a good why and how to maybe uncover it? I know that's a big topic, yes. but. Yes, it is a big topic, but it's one of my favorite topics. All right. and I want to just add one thing is the, the pain and pleasure is the distinction on that, Toby, is that nothing has meaning, but the meaning we give it. And until we decide that exercise is pleasure or pain, it is really neither. It just is something. And becoming a master of using those and interpreting things in a way that it serves you. So you could also say for, someone, for one person, eating pizza is absolute pleasure. For another person, it's absolute pain because they've associated the damage it'll create to them. And that, to me, is the key. Because most people go around and go, cold calling is painful. But no, the key is, how can I turn it around and make that pleasurable? That's the distinction. And that takes practice like anything else. I love it, man. And, and by the way, for everybody, that is so tweetable. It's a joke, right? Nothing has meaning other than the meaning we give it. Absolutely. And that's probably one of the most powerful things that, that I learned. Now, to get to the why part, I tell you, I was working with a client the other day, coaching them. And I said, okay, so, you know, what's your goal? And he goes, oh, it's awesome. I have, um, I have so many closings and I've created enough business that I could, I could make $100,000 in the month of September. And I go, he goes, I wish every month was like that. And I said, well, what's preventing that from happening? And he goes, well, um, you know, if, 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 uh, let me think. Uh, well, if I had that much business, then I actually wouldn't be able to spend time with my family, and I love spending time with my family. And I went, hmm. And what you'll notice, Toby, is that people have unconscious conflicts. So they want to be successful, but they want to be a family man. They have values around that. They want to spend time with their kids, pick them up from school or go to their soccer or whatever the case may be. So then they have a run where a whole bunch of business comes to them and their brain goes, you know, if you continue like this, you're not going to spend any time with your family and you're going to be a bad father. Yeah. And therefore, they stop attracting the business. They stop going for it. They sabotage themselves. Yes. So I think that people do want to live a legendary life. They do want to go for it. They want to have a huge life. They want to be in abundance. And then they run into these unconscious conflicts that were planted in there by their mother. You grow up and be a good father. Don't be like your father. Be a workaholic and never be home. Or whatever the case may be. And then they don't know why they can't have huge success. So for me, I think I've become conscious. I was fortunate enough that I grew up in a very... Um, I would say difficult environment. One of my favorite quotes is, if you do what is difficult in life, life will be easy. If you do what is easy, life will be difficult. If you never get up early and you always sleep in and you, you do that because your parents let you do that, by the time you have to get up for that job and you're, that, that starts at 6 o'clock in the morning, it's going to be difficult because you haven't built that muscle. So I was fortunate. I grew up on a farm. I did work hard. I did do things that I didn't think I could do. I started to have references where it said that even though I don't know a way, I will find a way. And therefore, when I went into running my business and, and the opportunity to, to become, go from an agent to a broker owner, even though I didn't have the money to buy it and the guy offered to sell it to me, my brain went, yes, before my mind said no, because the, no, the mind will try to protect you and say no. But I said yes, then I figured out a way to do it because I wanted to live a full life and I associate pleasure to growth, pleasure to learning, pleasure to challenge, pleasure to opportunity, pleasure to being number one, and I condition myself that way. So I think the gift I, I, I like to give my people when I'm coaching them is I say, if you're not sure what your purpose is in life, whatever you're doing, do it at 100%. Have that kind of an identity. 
that you're the type of person that does things at 100%. And I could tell you oodles of stories that me cleaning toilets or, or, or taking flying lessons that led to me partnering with somebody and becoming a, a, a owner of a plane at the age of 16, an owner of a restaurant in my early 20s, just because I cleaned the toilets better than anybody else. So somebody might say, well, you know, cleaning toilets led to that. Yeah, it's because how you do anything is how you show up in the world. And if people see you constantly having a high standard, then they're going to give you opportunities. Does that make sense, Toby? Yeah, you know, it does. It does. It, of course, it makes a lot of sense. You, you, what you're saying, though, you're saying, you know, um, this – here, first of all. Let me break in here with a message from our sponsor. Our sponsor, Discover Publications, will create a customized, branded, 12-page newspaper that will be sent out to your farm and sphere. Now, this paper is cheaper than you think. For slightly more than the cost of a stamp, you can start sending out curated content and always stay top of mind. Never lose a deal again because that prospect just happened to forget that you were in real estate or misplaced your number. Go check them out at discoverpubs.com. I know when I have a great interview because I, I constantly am looking down to make sure that I'm, I'm recording. And it's, it's such an unconscious thing for me. I'm like, am I getting this? Am I getting this? <clears throat> Anyhow, so, so it, that makes total sense. And I think one of the things that, that – one of the takeaways there, and you said it, but you know, if we can just say yes, there's so many things in life that – we get offered. It, this happens to me all the time. And I, I'm very deliberate. I'm like, oh, well, no, 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 no. Yes. Right. And if I just took the time and said, you know, if I said yes more often, I would, I would, uh, you know, serendipity happens. Right. And, and just like you, you clean the toilets better than anyone else. You did it 100%. You said yes. And ba bang, right. Opportunities presented themselves. But I want to, I want to go back here. And again, Rock, you, you're just dropping all that. This is going to be one of those episodes that people listen to two or three times. And by the way, man, if I'm talking fast, I, I think I told you last time we met, I said, man, if, whenever I have coffee before a morning interview, I, I tend to like sort of be a little aggressive. So I had a coffee right before we started recording. So <laughs> I'm trying to pull myself back. So I want to talk about self-sabotage because that's so, so important. This, this one guy, if we go back, he said, man, I'm going to make 100 grand in September. I wish every month. And, and, and he had all these limiting beliefs. Well, I can't have it all. If, if uh, October also is I make 100 grand and I have that in the pipeline, you know, I'm, I'm going to be neglecting my family. And then what happens, what you said, right? The, he, self-sabotage starts to work in. And, and this, this happens a lot of the time when, when we start to get success, right? You know, people think business should be hard, right? And, 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 and if you do your job right, if you build your business right, at some point you get into flow and business just starts happening. And I've seen it over and over again with myself and other people where when they get into flow and work becomes easy, they start to sabotage it. It shouldn't be easy. How much have you seen this? And, 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 and does this only happen with top performers or is this something that happens when, you know, when maybe even somebody's just building their business? Well, I've seen both and I see some people that uh, seem to be able to be very comfortable with it. I'd like to say that I'm comfortable, but I'm actually guilty of the same thing myself is, um, you know, from hearing so many times and having it implanted in my brain by my father that you have to work hard and you know, right. to make it. Um, as much as I, I pull that weed out of my mental garden, as much as I crush it and stamp on it and replace it with work smart and I attract everything great to me, et cetera, um, I think that that's an ongoing process, at least for me. I'd, I'd like to say it's different, but I think I have to continually meditate and pray and, and visualize that I attract good things to me. And every once in a while I have those days where I'm like, wow, look at all this stuff just floating my way. It's so cool. I'm totally open to receiving it. But I think most people, you know, they live from based on their references and they look around them and, you know, 85% of the population struggles, is broke, lives paycheck to paycheck. So there's a, a tribal um, national community of references where, you know, you basically to be, to get easily wealthy, you have to be a unicorn. Yeah. Or and be therefore, bad, or be a bad person, right? When people right. have that, right? Only, only, you know, uh, you know, I hear that all the time. Or people, that is a limiting belief. People think that you can only get rich or be wealthy or have a bunch of money if you screw other people over. Totally, but there are lots of references for that as well. So people just look out there and they they hear about this guy that climbed to the ladder, crushing somebody. This other person who took advantage of his suppliers and went bankrupt and da da da. So there's plenty of references for that too. 
you have to seek out those people that, that have done it well and then use them as the models and, and then grow from there. But it takes an effort to, to work your way through that. And quite frankly, most people, unfortunately, have given up. Is they're so tired. Not, they don't want to be disappointed again. Yeah. They don't want to be embarrassed again. So what do they do? As they come up with this story saying, I don't want to be wealthy. And that's a bit this guy was talking to is his story a little bit is if I'm that successful, I'm going to have to have an assistant. And if I have an assistant, then I have to manage that person. And what if I don't know how to manage that person? They go into their limiting beliefs. So they tell the story rather, I'm a family man. I want to be home to make dinner and I want to do this. I want to do that. At least that's my belief is they sell themselves a story to keep themselves where they are so they don't have to feel guilty about not going for the opportunities that would cause them to grow and live a more abundant life, which in reality would allow them to give back and have a, have a more prosperous environment as well as to give back to other you know, charities or whatever they might want to do. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a couple things in this in this uh, conversation here, Rock. You you you've uh, one thing that I think the, there's two words that you've used more than any other words, and it's it's visualization and then attraction, right? You know, I'm going to visualize X, right? What I want and why I want it, and I will attract that. Now, that a lot of people think this whole notion that the universe, you know, if you can visualize it and you will attract it, and the universe will, you know, you will manifest it. Um, a lot of people think that's just a little bit like too woohoo. Um, what, <laughs> what, what's your take on that? And, and how have you seen that work in your life? Well, um, I think the saying goes that God will help those that help themselves. And another one I've heard is you got to participate in your own rescue. Mm. So I think that the reality is it starts inside. It starts with that, that thought about what you can create inside. And then, you know, first you create it on the inside, then you manifest it on the outside. So the point being is that if your thoughts are, you know, clients are a pain in the butt, they, um, they're not reliable, they're not trustworthy, they, um, they, don't, they, they work with multiple agents or whatever the case may be, if you have those thoughts, you're going to be projecting that on some level. And I also like to say that your cells are eavesdropping on your conversation. Yes, man. So if you every day are saying, you know what, I'm getting better and better every day, I'm, and I'm an awesome uh, salesperson. I provide people with the true value that, that gets them the home they want and gets them a top dollar. And you start to truly feel and believe that. Then we go right back to the first thing we talked about, Toby, is that it's going to show up in your tonality. It's going to show up in your physicality. It's going to show up in the words that you choose to use. It's going to show up in your integrity. It's going to show up in your level of service. But if you're going around saying this business sucks and I can never make enough money and people are always grinding me down to the bone and taking advantage of me, if you're doing all of that, you're not setting a positive intention and you're going to then probably attract the people because what you seek, you will find. Yeah. Wow, man. Wow. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was I was actually you're you're like one step ahead of me, man. You're, you're saying something and I'm, I'm like writing it down going, I'm going to get to this. And all of a sudden you get there before me. Uh, I hate when that happens, man, because it makes me work a little bit harder. But um, so if we go back to the beginning, right, talk about this affirmations and you, sh- you will show up that way to, to the world. You said success breeds success. And it reminds me of something that that Robbins said, and I think in the wake of the giant within, you know, he, he says, you know, or at least he did. Uh, act as if, right? So Tony wanted, um, you know, he want, he had these ideas of, um, of uh, not like I know him, like Mr. Robbins, right? Uh, but but Robbins, uh, you know, he wanted to live in a castle. He wanted to have a, 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 a personal driver and all this stuff, right? But he, he didn't have the cash, so he acted as if. He went and bought a used old limousine, and he actually hired a driver. He, but he did it before he could afford it. And uh, – it reminds me of something our mutual friend Osborne, right? He says, hey, man, I am the $100 million man. I've not gotten there yet, but, but I, I believe that. And so in that belief, he, you know, he, he will get there. How important is this acting as if? And, and how, how would we implement that in our lives? Well, uh, you know, well said, Toby. Um, when I was uh, starting out as an agent and I was just trying to get my confidence up, one of the things that my coach taught me to do was just that. So the mantra I had was, I am the best agent in the West Island, which is the area I was working. I am the best real estate agent in the West Island. So I repeated it to myself, 
you know, over and over and over again. Similar to what an athlete or an actor might do before they go on stage. Jim Carrey used to do it. I'm the funniest man in the world. I'm the funniest man in the world. And he ran around telling everybody he could meet on the street and pulling funny faces, I'm the funniest man in the world. And I'm going to cash this check for $10 million. And sure enough, three years later, he did. So what you do is you, you are selling your identity and who you are to the cells in your body so repetitively that you actually believe it. And most people are doing what? The exact opposite. Yeah. I'm not good enough. And they're playing some old record that their mom or dad or uncle said is, you know, you're shy or, you know, you don't know how to speak properly or, you know, uh, you always have your head down. What's the matter with you, kid? You're never going to amount to much. So that's how they show up in life. And what I did was I just changed some of the recordings, Toby. You know, my brother and sister used to call me Pizza Face because I had a lot of acne. And when I learned this technology, you know, I, I look back on the effects it had on me growing up as a child. And I used to get up in the morning, look in the mirror. If I had a lot of acne, I'd tell my mom I had a, a tummy ache and I wouldn't go to school because I didn't want to be laughed at and embarrassed by the kids at school. Even though, you know, I look back, it wasn't as bad as I thought. But you know how you can you imagine a kid going down the hallway and two kids are kind of talking and snickering in the corner near right. a locker. Yeah. And you imagine they're laughing at you. Now, they might be laughing about something else or talking about something else, but you make up these images in your mind, and then you feel crappy for no good reason. So that was me growing up to the point that I moved to Australia because in Australia, they have sun 12 months of the year, and the sun dried up my acne and made me feel better about myself. So imagine that one little thought had that effect on me, yeah. yet when I learned how to change the programming through the coaching is I went from pizza face to ruggedly handsome. Mm. And I just said, I'm ruggedly handsome again and again and again. Every time I got up, every time I, I, I had a, a scar that showed up on my face from, from acne, I thought, man, I'm ruggedly handsome like Clint Eastwood. Right. He's cool, and ladies like him, and that's cool. I'm like ruggedly handsome. And I changed that record. And people could do that if they had enough passion and desire with any limiting belief. They just have to ingrain it. How interesting. Um, you know, you grew up on a farm, and, and you, you said you had, you had a fantastic line early. You said, you know, if you, uh, and I, I, can't, I didn't write it down, but it's something goes something like this, right? If you go, grow up in a difficult life, life will become easy. If you grow up in an easy life, life will be, look difficult or it will appear difficult to you. Now, if, uh, if I look at, right, so I have a background, as you know, in technology. I've done venture capital raises. Now, if you ask a venture capitalist what they're looking for, they're not necessarily looking for a product. They're looking for a type of person and, and, and you know, for a founder. And most of these founders, what they want, they, they want somebody who has a chip on their shoulder, somebody that needs to prove something to the world. And, you know, for you, when you were telling me that story, it reminded me of, you know, um, if you had acne and you felt poorly about yourself, you know, and, and we all have something that we feel bad about normally or what generally happens, we overcompensate. Right. And, and that that affects, you know, some por portion of our life. You've known lots of top producers. You are a very successful guy. Is there any truth to that notion that that it, there's a certain kind of person that will naturally succeed? Right. Somebody that has to prove themselves to the world or prove somebody else wrong. Yeah, I think there's a lot of credence to that, Toby. I think that if you look at a lot of very successful people in, in our, culturally speaking, in our environment where they have financial uh, you know, success or companies they've, uh, they've built up, et cetera, deep down inside, I think there's uh, actually quite a strong sense of um, you know, lack of self-worth self and self-confidence. But they compensate by saying, you know, it's like, for me, when I grew up, also another thing that, that people, my brothers and sisters, laughed at me is they said, you know, he can't string a sentence together. He can't speak properly. Hmm. And it's, it's funny how later on in life I became a public speaker. And I think that in a way I did that to handle that limiting belief. So my brain went, okay, apparently you can't speak properly and you can't string things together. What would be the, the thing that you could do that would make sure that that would be a falsehood? Well, become a public speaker. So I became a public speaker. Now, my brothers and sisters, what are they going to say? That talking thing didn't work out too well for you, Rock? Right? Right. So I do believe that people use those as motivations. So somebody who, let's say, feels like they, um, you know, they'll never, somebody told me you'll never amount to much. 
well, maybe they go out and they work 12, 14 hours a day and come up with, you know, Facebook or, or Instagram or something like that. And it's like, huh, see how, what I amounted to. So I do believe those can be catalysts. What I do believe, though, is that it won't lead you, lead you to fulfillment. It might get you results, it gets you achievement, but you're still going to feel empty and shallow inside. Wow. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I think you're probably right. I mean, I think I, um, I don't even know where to go with that. Um, so, uh, geez, um, you know, you, you will overcompensate. You might have success, but you still feel shallow inside. And, and look, at the end of the day, then, you know, th this. Th well, really what you're talking about is you're getting into the true definition of success, right? Success is not just about um, making a bunch of money or building a big company, right? You have to have all your pillars uh, supporting yourself, right? So in, and, and I'm going to let you take this away in a second, but you know, when we are in college, we're school, we, it's the three A's, right? It's academics, athletics, association, right? Those are the three things you focus on. And when you g grow up, right, you, there, there are different pillars. Talk to us about the pillars for success that, that you see. Well, I divide my life into, into gardens and, um, it just allows me to have focus in a different area. So, you know, I think as you get a little bit older, Toby, at least this has been my experience with people in my age, I'm 52 now, um, is the spiritual garden ends up becoming a little bit more powerful. Plus, you also get to a stage where you, um, the I don't give a crap meter starts to go up a little bit too. And you start to decide that there's less time in life, and I'm going to do things that I like to do with the people that I like to do them with, where versus before you might have tried it, you might have given in to that a little bit. So, I, I, you could you could also go into two major areas: the 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 you know the science of achievement and the art of fulfillment. Hmm. And I think you can achieve all those things, but you end up like a lot of people that are on that is you know you climb to the next peak and then that's not high enough. You got to go to the next one, the next one, and you get one house and you want two, and you get a car and then you want a sports car, and it's a never-ending rat race uh, treadmill that achievers get on and it becomes an addiction and you know you you become what you do repeatedly so if you keep on doing that achievement and that's who you think you are then you think you have to go out and do that and that's why some people they get to 45 or 55 and they just like cut it out and they go to India for a year and they meditate because they realize that they're on a dead-end street that that next achievement that next trophy that next right. number one didn't make them feel any happier so what I think that you get to at that stage, Toby, is you start to focus on, you know, two things, two major things, is your own personal awareness and growth and your contribution back. Some of the most fulfilling things for me are helping other people and giving to people that can give nothing to me. And that's something that, that I'm more interested in over time. And then my own personal awareness, you know, since, since uh, the last event that I was at with uh, my mastermind group, we all got into meditating and I've meditated every day since then. I think I'm on to about 30 or 35 days. And it's changed the way uh, my level of awareness of why I'm doing things and how I feel about them. And so I think that eventually when you have enough space, but well, let's face it, 85% of the world is just trying to pay the bills um, you know, right. for next week. And it's hard for them to get to that place. Yeah, totally. Um uh, and by the way, I was with you at that mastermind group and I, I, I did the whole meditation thing and I came back and I, 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 I didn't do it one more day. And I didn't, I didn't have a, everybody else had a goal of doing it. I, I didn't, um, I didn't, I, I wasn't good at it, Rock. Um, but so, so what you're talking about really, if you, you know, you were saying, Hey, you know, everybody wants to, they, they keep reaching for the next peak and then, you know, the next peak doesn't uh, make them happy. doesn't, doesn't fulfill them. So they say, I'm going to go to a bigger peak. I'm going to climb a bigger mountain. And in, and you, so really what you're talking about is, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And you know, yeah. when you at the peak of it, it's this self actualization, right? Acceptance and lack of prejudice and, you know, m morality and creativity and contribution and all that stuff. Now, what you touched on though, and what you said very eloquently is that 85% of the people, if they're, if they're just trying to pay the bills, you know, you don't have time. I don't know what it, I mean, you, you're, you haven't marched that path in order to even think about acceptance of facts or lack of prejudice or, you know, morality, right. Or contribution. Um, 
what happens, man? What happens if you know somebody's out there and they they know they want to be get to the the the, the, the be self actualized, but they're stuck in this this uh, you know this this hamster wheel of just you know work pay the bills I'm broke work pay the bills I'm broke. I mean, what is there some kind of shortcut or I mean you know look I mean you've been with Robbins for fifteen years I'm sure you've learned some kind of uh, hacks uh, life hacks. Well, let's use you as an example. You said that you did this meditation and then you weren't any good at it, so you stopped. Mm -hmm. So what was your expectation of that? How do you know you weren't good at it, first, first of all? Um, I don't. I don't. And, and when, again, when we were doing it, you know, uh, uh, Brent, Brett Jennings was the guy running it. He spent two years with Deepak Chopra. So this guy was a real guy, right? It wasn't Tina from 24 Hour Fitness. Um, <laughs> you, know, I didn't, you know what it is? I, I went into it with no expectations. So, you know, and I, ha I, I never thought about meditation before. So if I have, I, I didn't know what I'm, I don't, like, you know what? And I, you know, I think you're getting to this, right? So for me, like, I, I felt like there was a goal. And I was like, well, I'm not getting it because I don't know what it is. So if, if, if I'm very goal driven. So uh, if I didn't get it, that goal, like I felt like, OK, what's the use or I'm not good or. Yeah, well, I think that that's you hit the nail on the head and you're you're, uh, you know, perfect example of you're an achiever. And in this particular case, you weren't maybe clear on the outcome or you wanted to have an outcome. And I'm the, I'm the same way. I, I've wanted to meditate for 20 years. My sister's into it. My aunt is into it. They've been into it. They're into all that new age, age stuff, et cetera. And, and, and they're always telling me how I need to do it. I'm a type A. I'm always on the go. It's going to be so good for me. And then I sit down and I do it for one minute. And I'm like, this is doing nothing. I've got right. so many things to do. I want to go and create. I gotta, and I stop. But this particular time, I got it. And maybe it's just not your time yet. Mm. Because it's really all about the absolute opposite, which is just letting go and not and not having to achieve anything, not having to create anything, not having to manage anything, not having to think about anything, and creating that empty space to allow the universe thoughts, if you if you believe in that, to just filter in and and to solve your problems effortlessly, or to give you ideas that will that you can act upon that are going to be new and different instead of racing through the same structured thoughts that you have. They say 95% of your thoughts are the same as yesterday. And you're going to race through all of those again, Toby. And tomorrow you'll race through them all again. The meditation is about going, creating a space to allow new thoughts in and then create a new identity, a new choice, a new option, a new awareness, a new enlightenment, and allow you to grow as a person. So for me, it worked. I got it. But... I think most people um, are trying to achieve in life. And I think we've gotten off topic here and I'm off track, but no, no, I mean, you know, we, we did. It's okay. That's what we, that's what we do on this show, man. But you know, um, and, and it's so funny. There's a lots of times, not lots. I mean, a, a few times the, my guests are so good that I start listening rather than like moderating. So I was, right. I'm glad you stopped me. Cause I was like, I was going to let you go and I probably should have stopped you. Uh, uh, so look, let's go back to the 85% because you know, my audience is very, very striated. I have people that are just getting their license all the way up to people with, you know, brokerages that have, you know, 580. Agents. So, you know, if we're going to talk about that aspiring real estate agent, right, they're listening to the show, they're listening to you saying, hey, man, I want to learn, I want to add something to my to my library today. You know, you've seen a lot of people succeed, and you've seen a lot of people fail, right? You've seen people with all the talent in the world fail. And you've seen other people with very little talent. And they've succeeded in, in a big way. What's the difference between that person with talent that can't that you know, never really achieve success. And then that person that has very little innate talent, but they go out and they make it big. Well, I would answer that in this way is I give, I give you three steps that have worked for me and worked for me universally and anything that I wanted to, to grow or do better at is number one is you got to raise your expectations or your standards. So you decide you want to lose 10 pounds. You set a goal to lose 10 pounds. What you really said is I want to be healthier. I want to have more energy. If you want to grow your business, you want to, you want to double your business, increase it by 20%, then you're going to raise your standards there. Most people, though, unfortunately, have a, a long list of things that they would, they could, they should get to, only if circumstances are easier. So what I'm saying is they've got to make the, 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 the pact with themselves that they're going to get better. So they're going to be more disciplined, or they're going to be more excited, or they're going to be more energetic, or they're going to make one more call. But it starts with raising your standards. 
So if, if you decide in 2015 or 2016 or 2020, whatever your goal is over the years, that's the new goal. You've got to make it a must, not a should, an absolute must. Sometimes in seminars I say to people, how many of you have kids? And a whole bunch of people raise their hands. Great. How many of you have had to pick up your kids from school? A whole bunch of people say yes. And I go, how many of you have said, you know what, I don't really feel like it today. I'll get them tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, they laugh and they're like, you're kidding me. No, I get them every time. I go, but what, were, you, were you ever in a deal you were working on that was crucial and you needed to finish? They go, yeah, but I just told them I got to pick up my kids and, and I, I, you know, I drove across town or I got on the phone and I got my aunt to pick him up or my mom, but I made it happen and they got picked up. Man, Toby, if people made goals with that kind of conviction, with that kind of a must attitude, I'm going to increase my business by 20% next year because this is what's going to happen. This is what it's going to mean to my career. This is what it's going to mean to my life. This is the person I'm going to become in having to do that. Goals are just set, so you have to expand who you are as a human. It's not about 20% more. It's about who you need to become in order to create that result in your life. You want to give away to charity? You have to be somebody that adds more value in the world. So number one, step number one is raise a standard and make it an absolute must, and then tell somebody that you care about and respect, probably a coach that you have or a peer group or a mastermind group that you're part of, that this is what I'm committed to do. Now, you may stumble along the way. That's okay. But they're going to constantly be encouraging, celebrating, and prodding you to make that happen. And I guarantee you, if you do that in that way, you'll have the highest chance of success. Number two is you've got to change your identity. You said it before. Act as if. Act as if you're that person that makes 20% more or 50% more. Or while you're at it, set big goals because that's going to excite you. Small goals won't. So double it. So you've got to change who you are. You've got to describe yourself to yourself as the type of person that would do that. So you act as if you're already that person that's doubled the income. Let's say you go from 100 to 200 or from 200 to 400. How would that person behave? Who, what kind of time management skills would they have? What mm. kind of exercise routine would they have? How would they speak to people? What kind of books would they read, etc.? So you change your idea, identity. So number one, raise your standards, set your goals. Number two, change your identity. And then start to use affirmations or incantations in order to change your identity from pizza face to ruggedly handsome, from loser agent to number one agent in the West Island or wherever you work. And then the final thing is you've got to be strategic about it. So you've got to have some skill sets that are going to support that experience. And I'll give you a specific example. If you're going to be in sales, you're probably going to have to use social media on some level in order to make that happen. If you're in denial and say, I don't like that, that's difficult, that's hard, I'm not in the mood to learn that, you're probably going to have a harder time. So hire somebody, delegate it out, but be strategic. Easy for me to say. <laughs> I know, so I love that, man. Raise, raise your expectations, uh, uh, change your identity, right? Act as if, um, and then, um, and, and so, so, and part of that, I think, and, and we can talk about it for a second, but, you know, part of that is modeling, right? So if, you know, what you, you and really tied in visualization as well, right? So what would this kind of person, if I'm, if I'm going to go from 100 trans or two transactions to 100, what would that person look like, right? How would they manage their time? Uh, you know, you can ask all those questions, and, and, and you can do that, and you should do that. And, and the, I think the next step is find somebody who has, right? Rock Thomas has, you know, what, how does Rock, you know, let me watch Rock, and let, let me model Rock. You know, we were at lunch, I'm sorry, we were at dinner at that, at that event, and you turned to me and you said, hey, Toby, who is your mentor? Or did you have a mentor? And I, I, I gave you some names, but there are people that I had never met before. I can model a Tony Robbins without ever meeting him, right? He can be my, he can be my, my model, right? Um, anyhow, I know you can talk about that in a second and then we can get into the skill sets, but, um, you t talk to us about modeling a bit. And, and did you agree with what I said even? Yeah, 100%. Very, very well said. And it's been one of the, the big things that worked for me. When I went to see Tony Robbins in 2001, the very first event I went to, and I saw his, his, the magnitude of his energy, and that he could do 40, 45 hours in three days and go from 8 o'clock in the morning till 2 o'clock in the morning virtually all day long nonstop, I said, I don't care what this guy eats or drinks, but I want some of that stuff. Because I figured, how wrong could I go in following his diet versus the diet I had going for myself at the time? 
so I changed and I learned about uh, eating 70% greens and about the, you know, the, the frequencies of food and the impact it has and the toxins and the, and the poisons I was putting in my body changed that and my energy just went even higher through the roof and I thought, okay. So that was in essence modeling. And then I started to get into public speaking and I looked at, okay, what are some of the things that he does? He's a very good storyteller. So I'm going to have to learn how to become a better storyteller. Well, you know, oh, wait, wait, Rod, I don't want to, I, I don't, I, I want to just jump in here really quickly. I don't want to yeah, stop please. your momentum, but I just want everybody to know you're a guy that's 52 years old in terms of eating right and doing that. You're a guy that's 52 years old. You're unbelievably fit. You can do, we, we all had sort of a push up contest and you know, you could do 82 push ups in 60 seconds, right? It was just insane. And that, you didn't even compete because you knew you could blow everybody half your age away. So uh, in terms of eating right. So I'm sorry. So you're on, you're talking about public speech. I just want to awesome make sure. Me- that's an awesome memory you have. You have a very good attention to detail, Toby. Thank you, man. Um, and, and thank you. So, no, I appreciate that. And so you're right. Modeling is really all about finding the person that has the result that you, that you want, whatever it is. And then, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Just if, if, if somebody works out a certain way or, you know, if you, if you study successful people, which I've done most of my life, 99% of them exercise in the morning. And you talk to somebody who's struggling and you go, you know, Richard Branson said this. He goes, the number one thing that any entrepreneur could do to improve his business has nothing to do with his business. is to get his ass in the gym. Hmm. The number one thing. That's his advice. This is one of the most successful men on the planet, multi-billionaire, 300 companies. And his advice to entrepreneurs is go and exercise. Why? Because... You have endorphins that are released in your body that cause you to have higher ability to produce. So the hours on the job, you're producing at a higher level. But what do people do? They, they, you know, they run to the coffee machine and they, right. they stick eight coffees in their body all day long. And, you know, and, and that's because the guy next to them does it and, and the other guy does it. And just because it is normal doesn't mean it is natural. It just means that that's what everybody else is doing. So to end on your point of modeling, find, you know, find the top athlete. What, what do they do energetically? I went on a holiday not too long ago down in St. Lucia called Body Holiday. They say, give us your body for a week and we'll give you back your mind. They had an Olympic athlete down there and they trained us every morning. I mean, it was awesome. Their attitude, the way they look at their body, the, the stretching that they do before and after. They treat their body like a temple. Why? Because they want to get the most out of it. They have to get the most out of it in order to compete with other people. So it's become a science. So what I do is when I find a result that I want in my life, is I go to the people that are already getting it, and I, I take their years of, of research, and, and, and I just look at the result, and I go, okay, if you get up at that time and you work out for 45 minutes and you stretch for seven minutes, I guess I'll do that. I don't have to question it. I don't have to reinvent it. And people should do that in real estate as well is find the guy today, in today's market, in today's environment, with the internet, etc., and what are the most successful people doing, and then model that. Because if you're living in the past, you're going to get wiped out. Dude, I love it, man. And listen, we, we have to start wrapping up. You're, you're, you're one of those guys I could spend two hours on the phone with. But, but so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you this last question, then, then I'm going gonna, gonna to end up with our standard. But so... I'm going to pick somebody. I'm going to see somebody, right? There's lots of people out there that I'm going to go, I'm going to, I like what that guy's doing. I want his business. I want his life. I'm going to model that guy. The problem is, the problem is they're, they're look at some, let's say it's door knocking. They're like, ah, I know he, I had a guy thatch new in on this show. His deal was he knocked a hundred doors a day for 10 years. By, he did that. By year three, he was making a million bucks a year, and he owned like 17 houses, right, free and clear. Clearly, that works. But people go, and they can see it, and they're like, ah, yeah, I know I should do that, but I, I, should, I, I, I can't do it, right? So really what I'm asking, like, how does somebody expand their comfort zones? They see, they see and they know intellectually what they need to do, but that, they're like, that's just not in my comfort zone. What kind of advice would you give that person? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. Sorry, uh, man. Number one is there's different personalities. So we, many people know about the DISC model, which is a behavioral assessment that determines your personality. Somebody who's introverted and who really doesn't like to connect with people, that might not be the best route for them. They might be better to do some Facebook um, you know, advertising or learn a little bit more about search engine optimization and things like that and have leads come to them. But for the person who has a, a natural um, personality fit for that, absolutely. 
but definitely you've got expireds for sale by owners. You have door knocking, you have networking, um, you know, try to fit your personality to that area. Mm. But that being said, um, you know, there's a, a well-known uh, science that's written in the book, The Rise of Superman. It talks about the fact that these people that do daredevil sports and do extreme sports, they stretch their capacity based on the fact that they call up on resources in their body that are dormant for most people. What do I mean by that? Well, if you go to the edge of a cliff and you're going to go bungee jumping and they're just about to get you going, you're going to feel a change physically in your body. And those are hormones and chemicals that are moving around in order to prepare you for potential danger. And the release of nepoepherine or um, anandamide or uh, natural endorphins will actually heighten your capacity to, um, to perform. So these athletes continually heighten their ability to perform. It, it increases their wide-angle lens. It increases their ability to notice patterns. The pattern might be the husband and wife looking at each other across the table, but you pick up on that pattern that she's shaking her head saying no to him. But because you're in a heightened state, you're on performance, you're ready to go, you're locked in because you have that absolute goal, you're going to double your sales next year, and you're on when you're in front of the client. You are focused, and this is showtime. When you've trained yourself, to go that way, boom, you're able to turn that around and you're able to turn it into a sale versus into, you know, we'll think about it overnight. The key is 4% outside of your comfort zone. 4% has been proven as the key growth area. If you go too far out your comfort zone and I ask you to jump out of a plane without a parachute and dive after the parachute we just threw out, it's probably going to freak your system out so much that you're going to shut down and it's fight or flight. If we get you to jump out with somebody else, you probably could handle that. Do that every day over time, your comfort zone expands. And that's what most people don't get, is they look at their life and they look at what they want in their life down the road and they go, oh, that can't happen for me. It's too much work. And they talk themselves out of it. So the quick answer is 4% more. Make four more calls than you made yesterday. We can make one more call. Get up and walk for one minute. Tomorrow, walk for two minutes. The next day, walk for three. And before you know it, at the end of the month, you're walking for 30 minutes. It's doable as long as you're committed to a great life. And that requires visualization, in my opinion. It requires some, some focus on what you want. And the, and the optimization of what we talked about earlier was the pain and pleasure. Oh, my God, Rock. I love it, man. I love it. And look, yeah, 4%. I love that model. You know, and here's the other thing, too. And again, I don't want to get on this. I know we're taking up a bunch of your time. Um, the, you know, if you can only get 1% better, if you can get 1% better today, right, and you can get 1% better tomorrow, it, it, at the end of the year, you know what, you're going to be 365% better, and not even counting the compound effect, right, that, that you get in there. Right. So, so just, you know, just that 4% of that 1%. I love it, Rock. Hey, man, um, so here's, uh, here's the, the last question I ask everybody. I'm an aspiring real estate agent. I have 25 bucks. What book should I go buy today? Oh, wow. Um, that's a great one. Um, As you're scanning your library right now. <laughs> Jeez, I would have to go with um, probably an old classic is uh, Ogmandino's The Greatest Salesman in the World. Got it. I um, well, you know, that's a great book. Um, and if you haven't read that book, you can get a free copy. Just use our link, audibletrial.com slash superagentslive. Hey, dude, Rock, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure talking with you. Tell everybody where they can find you because I know people are going to want to reach out and say thanks and, and, and maybe ask you the question offline. I don't know if you have time for that, but, you know, let us know where we can find you. Yeah, I mean, the easiest way is just to, to look up Rock Thomas in uh, Montreal, Canada on Facebook, but you can also go to, um, to my website, uh, uh, rockthomas.com, and there uh, should be a message there. I'd be happy to, to have a chit-chat or uh, connect with you. And um, I have a book called The Power of Your Identity, and I think that um, if people really want to do that step two and change their identity, there's, some, there's five really easy steps that worked for me for – um, and allowed me to become, you know, from, from broke uh, to millionaire. And, um, and I, I credit it to that process. I love so, it, man. I love it. And I'm looking at your Facebook page, Mastering Real Estate Sales, Rock Thomas. You have more likes than I do. I don't know how that happened. But hey, buddy, <laughs> thank you, man. I really appreciate you coming on. And I would love to maybe do a, a, a session two sometime in the future. A pleasure being on the, on the call. Appreciate See, it. See you, bud. 
Okay, bye. Let's go. Yeah. For those of you that want to know what we're all about, it's like this, yo. This is 10% luck, 20% skill, 15% concentrated.